name's Regan. I work for Anthony J. Lyon, Detective Bureau. They call me the Lion's Eye. Sunday at 8.30, and CBS brings you Jeff Regan, Investigator, starring Frank Graham as Regan, with Frank Nelson as Anthony J. Lyon. So stand by for mystery, suspense, and adventure in tonight's transcribed story titled, There's Nothing Like a Pork Chop When Supper Rolls Around. It took a heap of threatening notes to make Buddy Huckle afraid, and we had plenty of threatening notes in this one. Individual words cut from poems and pasted on plain white paper to create a message of death. If you enjoy poetry, you hate Huckle. And everyone connected with this case enjoyed poetry. Maybe it has something to do with the dictaphone that wound up telling too much and a leggy blonde that told too little. It was three in the afternoon when I checked in with my boss, the lion, at the detective bureau. Somehow, he looked different. Jeffrey, my boy. Then I saw he was wearing a flowing black tie. Uh, uh, Listen to this, Jeffrey. Where's your cape, Fatso? Uh, Listen. Listen to the exhortation of the dawn. Look to this day, for it is life, the very life of life. In its brief course, lie all... Poetry? You, lion? But just because you have no appreciation of the finer things in life, Jeffrey, doesn't mean that I... Whose poetry? Well, mine, of course. You, the head of a detective agency, writing poetry? A man who appreciates the beauty of the universe, the richness of living... What's in it for you? The... What do you mean by that snide remark? What do you get out of writing this poetry? I reap calm, peace, my boy. How much money? Now look here, Jeffrey. How much? $10,000 if I win. Win what? Well, our new client told me about the contest, my boy. There's a $10,000 prize for the poem, which in the opinion of the judges... Uh Uh-huh, I thought. Okay, Lion, who's the new client? Buddy Huckle, the poet, America's bard laureate. What's Hucklebuck's trouble? Uh, No, 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 Uh, Buddy Huckle. It seems someone is trying to intimidate him, keep him from creating more poetry. Uh, Where do I find this bard? At his office. Office? Well, he has to work someplace. Now, you get right down to this address and do what you can. Did he, uh, pay you? (laughs) There was a check for $200. Buddy Huckle is solvent. For an artist, that's suspicious. Do a good job, my boy, and the Lion Detective Agency might turn up in his memoirs. If I expected to find Buddy Huckle writing poetry in a hidden nook, I was in for a surprise. His office was on the Miracle Mile, brand new building, all glass and angles and curves. I checked the address the lion had given me just to make sure. This was it. I squeezed into the Lucite elevator with salesmen, briefcases, secretaries, and a temperature of 110. Up in his office, there was a small desk and a little man behind it. Maybe 50, with a pink seamless face and short white hair like uh, popcorn glued to a billiard ball. May I help you, sir? Your buddy Huckle? Uh, Just a moment while I staple these poems. My name's Regan. I'm from the Lion Detective Bureau. Oh, yes. Uh, Mr. Huckle told me you were coming. Won't you sit down? I I purchased that chair from the estate of H.W. Longfellow. Where is Mr. Huckle? Uh, Just a moment while I... uh... Uh, Use the stapler. Yes. Yes. Oh, that's Mr. Huckle now. Uh, Yes, sir, Mr. Huckle? Come in here, Laszlo. Uh, Yes, sir, Mr. Huckle. Running behind schedule today. Uh, Coming, Mr. Huckle. The little man grabbed the stack of stapled poems and made for the inner office, his arms and legs working like a crab's. When he disappeared into the inner office, I took a look around. Hung on the wall was a certificate of merit from the Amalgamated Advertising Agencies of America, made out to Buddy Huckle. It read in gold leaf, Your poems move merchandise. There was a stack of magazines on Laszlo's desk. I reached for one and was about to open it when Laszlo reappeared from the inner office. Dear, 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 such a busy day. When can I see the poet? Oh, soon, soon. Oh, you disturbed my stapler. I, uh, oh, well, I must have done that when I picked up this magazine. Yes, yeah, a wonderful magazine. Mr. Huckle contributes to it uh, regularly. Uh-huh. Folk stuff. Oh, yes. Uh, oh, Mr. Huckle again. Uh, yes, sir? Sand Regan in Lilo. Uh, yes, Mr. Huckle. 
I may go right in. Why, uh, yes, but uh, <laughs> uh, don't take too much of Mr. Huckle's time. He's a very busy man. I found Buddy Huckle seated behind a bluish cast aluminum desk. Very utilitarian. Utility, Mr. Regan. No frou-frou here. Buddy Huckle had been handsome, but now he was a gross 40. His overlarge face hung in little white puffs, damp-looking. Your time, Mr. Regan. You don't get work done sitting in the sun. Over Huckle's desk hung the motto, Drive. Regan, I can give you three minutes. You're paying for it. Hey, uh... <laughs> you Regan, I like you. Thanks, thanks. You're utilitarian. No frou-frou. No... <laughs> What's the matter, Huckle? <laughs> little white... Box. <laughs> Desk. Huckle was dying. His lips gathered blue patches around the edges. His huge head rolled weakly. I opened his desk and found a small white box. Inside, there were pills as big as bullets. I shot one into his gaping mouth and he swallowed. In moments, his body firmed and he seemed to have come out of it. Yeah. Heart attack, Reed. Nothing. Have them all the time. <laughs> Drive myself too hard, but... That's all right. I've got money. It makes nice salad. <sighs> You've given me a poem. Uh, you use a dictaphone? Of course. Did you think I wrote poetry with a quill pen and olive ink? Poem. Title. Money ain't salad. Money ain't salad, neighbor. It won't help you when you're down. There's nothing like a pork chop when supper rolls around. So spend your wealth, but not your health. Live wisely. T uh, t uh, t take a tip. For money sure ain't salad. It sure won't cure the grip. Signed, Buddy Huggle. America's Bard Laureate. Exactly. Hundred dollars a line. Who's giving you trouble, Huckle? Don't know. Take a look at these. Hmm. Poison pen notes. Mm -hmm. Nasty bit. Uh huh. Paste up letters. No one's handwriting appears, so you couldn't check a typewriter. Very smart. Yeah, all these words came from my published poem. Yeah, individual words cut out of the poems, then pasted on a plain piece of white paper so they form a message. Read that one. One more poem with a chuckle, and death will take you huckle. Oh, crude poetry. Rank imitation of my product. And someone's threatening your life. Trying to scare me into not competing in this year's Hotchkiss Award for time capsule poetry. Time capsule poetry? Yeah, yeah. the winning poem is placed in a time capsule and buried for posterity by Hotchkiss University. To win means nationwide publicity and, of course, a $10,000 prize. Yeah, the lion told me. Uh, you have any idea who might want to stop your... You're creating? No, that's why I'm paying your agency. Mm -hmm. Who publishes most of your stuff? I have a contract channeling my efforts into Folk Stuff magazine. Okay, Huckle. If you need me, call me at Folk Stuff the magazine. Wait, 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 Regan. Yeah? Regan, I'm scared. He was scared. But it didn't stop his reaching for the dictaphone when I left. I'd given him another idea for a poem when I said I was going to check Folk Stuff. The magazine was located out in the acute section of Westwood. The building was three stories high and constructed to look like Paul Bunyan. The elevator operator said, Howdy, neighbor. And took me to the editorial offices. I uh, expected to see old Father William behind the editor-in-chief's desk. But what I found was young, blonde, formed by a strict diet and exercise, dressed by Vogue, and had a voice like a warm night. Come in, Mr. Regan. Uh, the secretary said I'd find the editor-in-chief in here. Sit down, Mr. Regan. I'm the editor-in-chief. Ah, uh, yeah. My name's Julie. If you're a writer, Mr. Regan, I'll publish you. Well, that's not what I had in mind. Then perhaps we might do a manuscript together. That's nice, but... I'll just turn on the phonograph. I hope you like American folk music. Love it. Get so lonely working up here in Paul Bunyan. We can be lonely anywhere. People think me unapproachable. <laughs> I surprise them. Sure, lady. Now about uh, Buddy Huckle. No, oh, him. Uh, come to think of it, maybe I'd rather hear about you. How come? All this? Yeah. <laughs> Why I'm in charge of a folksy magazine? Something like that. There's money in folks, Mr. Regan. I bought out this magazine when I learned how many folks there were in America. Oh, do the... Uh... Folks know about you? We don't have many folks out here in California. Mostly the sophisticated type, Mr. Regan. The kind that would take advantage of a girl if they were 
left alone with her. Uh Uh-huh. But I see you want to get back to Buddy Huckle. Yeah, I had that in mind. What do you want to know? Do you know anyone around here that would like to see Huckle stop producing poetry? (laughs) Practically all of us feel that way. Or maybe kill him? We're all of us capable of murder, aren't we, Mr. Regan? Works that way. But why do you ask about Buddy Huckle? Well, he has a contract with your magazine. You publish all his poetry. There must be some mistake, Mr. Regan. Hmm? I don't publish a line of his. I nodded once because of impact. Then I nodded again to say goodbye. I left still nodding to the elevator operator who said... So long, neighbor. Uh, you know anything about Buddy Huckle? Yes, he's doing a big broadcast from an Oklahoma barbecue over Long Beach night, neighbor. I headed for Long Beach to have a long talk with Buddy Huckle. It was beginning to look like a publicity setup. When I arrived, I found the broadcasting studio on the fifth floor of the Ocean Stone Hotel. Just outside the studio door stood a woman, middle-aged, her hand gripped in her handbag. That old look of murder on her face. Let go of my arm. What's in the handbag, lady? If you think I'm going to say hairpins, you're nuts. All right, let's take a look. I got a gun. I thought maybe... Let me go! You're looking for someone? Yeah. That louse, Huckle. You've been sending him love notes? You've cut out of magazines? Who are you? Regan, private investigator. Well, I'm not afraid of you. That's nice. I was Buddy Huckle's wife, Regan. Now he's cut off my alimony and I'm going in there to shoot him dead. Uh, a lot of people in there, lady. Witnesses. Oh. You say you're right. Thank you. You talked me out of it. Goodbye, lady. Goodbye, mister. And Thanks. The broadcasting room was a regular hotel room that had been wired for sound. There was a character in a padded suit that kept eyeing a clock and rubbing his moist hands on his sleeves. This must have been the producer. Buddy Huckle was seated at a green top table, his eyes on the papers in front of him. Wasn't quite ten, so I said hello. Hello, Regan. I'm on the air in two minutes. Oh, that's a lifetime, <laughs> Huckle. <laughs> if you had a dictaphone, you could make yourself a thousand dollars in two minutes. Maybe five hundred. Uh, you don't look scared. Uh, oh. Oh, that, you, you can forget our little talk of this afternoon. <laughs> While I was dictating this afternoon, the culprit walked in, Mr. Reek, and I found out who it was threatening me, sending me the notes. Would you mind telling me who? Oh, nothing to worry about, nothing at all. I, I don't know why I was so concerned. Just figure your time and make me a refund on my retainer. A certified pleasure. Huh? Quiet, please. We're ready to cut you in now, Mr. Huckle. I'm ready, George. Okay, stand by. You're on the air in a second. Take my cue. Well, howdy, folks. Uh, this is America's board laureate, Buddy Huckle, a talking to you. And, folks, I got a swell little old poem for you folks that I hope you're plumb going to like a lot. I, I kind of like to call it Money Ain't Salad. goes, say, money ain't salad, neighbor. It won't help you when you're down. There's nothing like a pork chop when stuff rolls around. I couldn't take it. I gently made my way around George, the radio producer, to the door and out. It took me a little time to make my way through the crowd down to the street, and I stood there on the sidewalk for a few moments, wondering about Buddy Huckle. Maybe Huckle wasn't as safe as he thought. That was his business now. And suddenly, high overhead, above the sounds in the street, there was a shattering of glass. Screams from the street as a figure came hurtling toward the pavement. I jumped. Just in time. The body hit the sidewalk. If you looked hard, you could recognize what was left as Buddy Huckle. The final poetic touch was a framed sign that hit right after the body. On the sign was the motto, Drive. This is CBS, and you are listening to tonight's adventure with Jeff Regan, investigator, entitled There's Nothing Like a Pork Chop When Supper Rolls Around. A man's body was spread eagled on a concrete sidewalk. He'd fallen, or been pushed, from the fifth floor of the Ocean Stone Hotel. The body had belonged to a poet named Buddy Huckle. Very popular guy. (laughs) His discarded wife had been in the hotel gunning for him. And somebody had been sending Huckle notes threatening his life. Maybe his wife. Now he didn't have to worry about the race for popularity. He was dead. 
Since all concerned were L.A. people, Homicide finally put Sanducci on the case. When Sanducci finished in Long Beach, we drove back to L.A. in his squad car. The hearse following us. Facts, Regan. Look at the facts. Facts can lie, Sanducci. What's your theory? You can't convict on theory. Hmm. Speed it up, Max. We'll never make L.A. Okay, what are your facts, Sanducci? Look, fact one. Let me try. Buddy Huckle is dead. Mm. Smart boy. Fact two? He fell to his death from five stories up. Right. His former wife was spotted at the scene of the crime. And she was gunning for her former husband, Buddy Huckle. You said so yourself, Regan. Oh. What about George, the radio producer? He was still in the studio. Didn't see anything. Step on it, Max. Um, there were no witnesses. There were three. Huh? They say they saw a woman running away from the scene of the crime. Oh, you know how witnesses become confused, Sanducci. They may all be wrong. Said woman became lost in the crowd during the confusion. Yeah, and you now have an all-points call-out on Buddy Huckle's former wife. The woman is dangerous, Regan. She's armed. Well, didn't the witnesses say they saw anything else? How much you want a witness to see, Regan? Be satisfied. You know the trouble with facts, Sanducci? You gotta stop when you've got all that'll fit. Where do you place that motto that came down on top of the body? Give it time. It'll fit. Yeah, well, it so happens it came from the wall of Buddy Huckle's office. Look, did you ever hear of planted clues, Regan? The dame is trying to outsmart us. She planted the sign, tried to throw us off. All right, have it your way, Sanducci. Hurry up, Max. We got to get back to L.A. fast. Hey, why is he slowing down? Regulations. Max doesn't take orders from anybody but me. All right, step on it, Max. in town, the time of night you think you see figures waiting with knives in every puddle of dark. 3 a.m. First, I had to check with the lion. I made it to his apartment. There was a wafer of light coming from under his door. I walked in. The lion was sound asleep on the couch. A pencil hanging from his mouth, sheets of scribbled paper on the floor. Come on, lion, get off the... <laughs> Hello, public library. Oh, oh it's you, Jeffrey. Uh, expecting a love bandit? Ooh, I must have forgotten to lock the door. One world and a lock on every door. Oh, as a matter of fact, I, I was working on my entry for the Hotchkiss Award for Time Bomb Poetry. Capsule. Oh, yes. I have another stanza, Jeffrey. Listen. The glory of action, the splendor... Lion, of... our client is dead. Dead? Oh, but, but that's horrible, my boy. When? No How? time for that. Look, I gotta have your help to find Buddy Huckle's former wife. Yeah, but I'd planned on spending the rest of the night working on my poor. Her first name is Mona. That's all we've got. You've got to find her while I check on a dictaphone and a blonde editor. Oh, a description, Jeffrey. About 5'10", medium build, brown hair. Uh, last seen in Long Beach wearing a yellow cotton dress, no hat. You're racing the police on this one, Lion. And when you get her, hang on, but be careful. She's wanted for murder. For what I needed, there was only one place to go now. The inner office of the late Buddy Huckle. Dark inside the office. Very. The door to the inner office was locked. None of my keys would work, so I used my shoulder. <coughs> the door gave, and I was in the inner office. I snapped the lights on. When a man's just dead and you're in his room, you keep looking around for him. And I was alone, and I saw what I wanted, the dictaphone. I played the wax roll that was on the machine. Sign the Bard Laureate Buddy Huckle. I heard a lot of stuff, poems mostly, delivered in his rapid-fire manner. Then I heard myself. You used a dictaphone? Of course. Do you think I wrote poetry with a quill pen and more of ink? Poem, title, Money Ain't sa I lifted the playback head. For luck, I tried the end of the dictaphone record. This was really good. The sign comes, the silent thrust of death by the tempered blade. Sharp, sweet sharpness. I refuse to read any more of this tribe. Yeah, that didn't sound like Buddy's rhyming cry pie type of poetry. I played the very end of the record to get the signature signed Buddy Huckle. But instead, I got... You've made me read this, but I won't sign this lousy poem. That was the end of the record. Suddenly, without looking up, I knew there was someone standing behind me. You're Regan. Mona. 
I saw you earlier, now I see you again. What are you doing here? I ain't so dumb, I don't know the cops are after me. Well, they probably know you're here right now. I snuck in. Now, you're not going to reach into that purse for your gun again. I hocked it in an all-night joint. Well, look, why don't we just sit down quietly and talk, Mona? Yeah, well, I ain't so dumb, I don't know what you're trying to do, mister. What am I trying to do, Mona? Well, I... I just came here to see if maybe Huckle made out an alimony check for me and maybe didn't mail it. That's what I'm trying to do? I need all the money I can get now that the cops are hot after me for something I didn't do. You're sure you didn't push Buddy Huckle through that window, Mona? I ain't got the strength. No, guess not. I need dough to run away from the cops, Mr. Regan. Maybe maybe you could take my case, huh? I got six bucks for the gun. Well, maybe I can help you, Mona. Look, hold up in the Rondo Hotel. Give a fictitious name. The police are liable to check this office. Gee, you've been real good to me, Mr. Regan. You took my case and... Here's my six dollars. No, thanks. We'll take it up with the lion later. The lion? Uh, never mind. But find that hotel. I've got to find an editor-in-chief. The phone book gave me Julie's home address. Julie being the editorial brains behind Folk Stuff magazine. It was almost dawn now, but when I rang the doorbell of her swank apartment, I got an immediate response. Come in, Mr. Regan. I went in. You know, the police have already come and gone. Yeah, they get around. You're expecting to find something they didn't? Hmm? Thought maybe. Drink, Mr. Regan. Well, it has been a long night. Say when. Now. Hmm. Rugged individualist. Decided to do that manuscript with me? Not what I had in mind, lady. Maybe you'll tell me what you did have in mind. You were closer to Buddy Huckle than most people know. <laughs> Just so, sir. So. Huckle had a reputation as a poet. He set you up as editor of Folk Stuff magazine. But you were pretty rich, even for his blood. You know, <laughs> you're wrong, Mr. Regan. I am? But it makes a good story. More? Why don't you try? Maybe it'll make more sense. The magazine Folk Stuff does belong to me, Mr. Regan. No strings. Although Huckle did like to spend money on women, I wasn't one of them. Sounds good. Go on. Buddy Huckle had a reputation that helped sell my magazine. There was only one thing. He couldn't write poetry. Oh. Ah. So when you told me that Huckle didn't write a line that went into folk stuff, you weren't lying. Huh? <laughs> Even I couldn't stand his poetry. I made little changes here and there in every line. It gave me a sense of accomplishment. He didn't seem to mind. Mm -hmm. Well, lady, I guess that's all here. Well, Mr. Regan... Lonely Julie grabbed my lapels, held me tight, and kissed me, but... But I managed to break away. After a while. I had to leave in the line of duty. And the man I had to see was the one that had last seen Buddy Huckle alive. George, the radio producer. I reached him at his home. Mr. Regan. You produced Buddy Huckle's broadcast at the Ocean Stone Hotel last uh, night. Lousy show, no fire. Yeah, but you were the last man to see Buddy Huckle alive. Uh, no, there must have been somebody else. You followed Huckle out into the hallway after the... Uh, lied to the police, you must have seen something. What? I stayed in the studio. Talk, George. It... Open up. No, oh, ow, oh, oh. I don't want to get mixed up in it. Talk. Let me alone. No. All right, all right. I got a police record back in Shy Regan. You won't... No deals, but make it the truth. Okay, okay. It was just I uh, didn't want to get mixed up in no killing. What'd you see? I followed the star out of the studio like I always do to tell him it was a great show. Yeah? Only when I opened the door, I saw this little guy pop out of the crowd and plant his two hands against the star. Buddy Huckle. Yeah, and push him through the window. Thanks, George. That's all I need. I tried to step back before I saw it happen. I, I got a record, Regan. Sure. Try not to worry, George. Everything may turn out all right. The little man, George, had seen push Huckle out of the window could be Laszlo. Huckle's secretary. I checked all morning trying to find Laszlo, but he disappeared from the face of the earth. Then I got to thinking what kind of a guy Laszlo appeared to be. A thinker. Now, where would a thinker type go to hide if he was afraid of something? Some place familiar to give him a sense of security, yet off the beaten path. It hit me. Sure. The public library. And that's where I found him. Two flights below street level in the last reference room. Laszlo. His round popcorn white head was bent over a book. Hanging above his head was the public library sign, Silence. Uh, 
It's you again. Come with me, Laszlo. No, no, you shan't take me alive. Stop poking your pocket at me, Laszlo. It's a, it's a dueling pistol. It belonged to Edgar Allan Poe, and it'll fire again in righteous cause. Yeah, sure. Now listen, Laszlo. I know you finally blew your top about Huckle's poetry. You sent him those pasted notes threatening his life to keep him from writing anymore. He dictated his poetry. Dictated. It's all over, Laszlo. No, no, no. You can't prove anything. You were seen pushing Huckle to his death. Oh. But I... I just couldn't stand it any longer. Today, after you left, I held this dueling pistol to his head and made him dictate one of my poems for spite. And then I resigned. Go on. He put money ahead of art. With his reputation, he was going to win the Hotchkiss Prize without their even looking at his work, while my poetry would go begging. Do you realize that I am one of only four men in the world who really understands Gertrude Stein? Go on, Laszlo. I didn't want to hurt him. Just, just, just frighten him into ceasing to write poetry. You followed him to the broadcast last night. Yes, it was a last resort. I was going to interrupt the broadcast, tell the world he was an imposter, not a poet. Yeah, but you had the motto from his wall with you. Yes, positive proof of his inartistic approach. His motto was drive. But I couldn't go through with it. I was leaving when... You saw Huckle leave the scene of his latest triumph, the broadcasting studio. This was too much. You killed him. I was blind with rage. In pushing Huckle, you dropped the motto out of the window, huh? Well, I, I, I don't know. I, I, I don't remember. It all happened so fast. Let's forget the dueling pistol, Laszlo. Just come along quietly. No. No, you shan't take me alive. Hand that gun over, Laszlo. No, stand back! The dueling pistol went off in his hand. The bullet cracked the ceiling. I grabbed the gun away from Laszlo. He didn't put up much of a fight. And then I led him from the library as quietly as possible. Sanducci, down at Homicide, felt as sorry for Laszlo as I did. But now Laszlo should have plenty of time to write poetry and not worry about selling it. State will take care of him. George, the radio producer, got a dressing down for withholding information. And I called Mona to tell her she was no longer under suspicion. And that wrote the end. It was high noon when I checked in with my boss, the lion, at the bureau. He was reciting. Oh, yesterday is but a dream, and tomorrow is only a vision. You still can enter the poetry contest, Fatso? Of course, my boy. The ten thousand's as good as mine. I've just completed my work of art. Okay. How does it go? Oh, it's classic, Jeffrey. Uh, Reminiscent of ancient Sanskrit poetry. In translation, of course. Well, I've had a hard night. But I'd like to hear it. Well, you've heard most of it. I'll just give you the ending. Mm -hmm. Go on. And tomorrow is only a vision. For today, well lived, makes every yesterday a dream of happiness. Ah, oh, that's real fine. Oh, yes. And every tomorrow, a vision of hope. Uh, why are you walking around? Oh, just looking, Lion. Now, you just sit still while I finish. Look well, therefore, to this day... Such is the salutation to the dog. Uh-huh. Hey, What's this in your wastebasket? Uh, uh, nothing, Jeffrey. A library you, book. You, you give me that. Oh, no. The cleaning woman must have dropped it there. What title of book? Great Poems by Unknown Poets. Yeah. <laughs> well, since nobody claims him, Jeffrey, it would be a shame to see them go to waste. Investigator is written by William Frug and Gilbert Thomas, produced and transcribed by Sterling Tracy, and stars Frank Graham as Regan, with Frank Nelson as Anthony J. Lyon. Original music is by Dick Arant. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.